Okay, so then uh, let's welcome Nick Shannon from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. Uh, and this talk is going to tell us more about semi-classical simulation of spin one magnets. So Nick, uh, we look forward to your talk and it's over to you now. Okay, thank we'll you. We'll have 35 minutes and I'll just mark and then five minutes for discussions roughly. Okay, sounds good, thank you. So um, I feel like I should begin by saying thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. And again, sorry, I'm not there. In fact, I haven't really been traveling very much um, at all this summer. This is partly because of the remaining complexities of traveling from Japan and partly because there was something else keeping me busy. Uh, so this is somewhere in between an apology and an advert. Um, I've been busy setting up a, a theoretical sciences visiting program at OIST, taking inspiration from some of the very successful visiting programs for theoretical physics worldwide spanning other sciences and um, we now have two calls open one for individuals to come and visit um, for a period of of up to a year uh, and one for programmatic activities uh, so for groups of people to come to visit and and do stuff together and maybe host a, a workshop while they're doing it so uh, the deadline is is now getting relatively close, but if you have any interest, uh, please do take a look at this or, or, or send me an email. We'd be, we'd be very happy. To, I'd obviously be happy to see my own field represented. Um, okay, so um, back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. Spin one magnets are, I claim, interesting. Uh, here's a fairly well celebrated example. Uh, it's a spin one triangular ladder system, which was offered as an early candidate of a spin pneumatic as a T-squared heat capacity at very low temperatures in the absence of obvious magnetic order. This is a more recent, very interesting material. It's a nickel-based pyrochlor, which shows spin-liquid behavior with quite interesting dynamics above a spin-freezing temperature. Uh, and here's a, a, a really very highly documented example of a, of a slightly more conventional magnet, which has a has a nail type ground state, but um, an interesting hybridization between spin one and spin two excitations, uh, which has been worked out in some detail. So um, obvious question, if these magnets are interesting, we'd like to be able to simulate them, say something about them, and about then it gets hard. I mean, fully quantum simulations for spin half are already hard and the Hilbert space is growing faster for spin one. So, so what can we do? Well, for spin half, there's an alternative approach which works kind of better than it should really, uh, and which exploits the mapping of a spin half onto a block sphere. So any state of a spin half we can represent as a, as a vector or better to say a vector of fixed length, a point on a sphere. Uh, so the classical limit of the spin half moment is, is just an O3 vector. You can also think about this as a large S limit, but you don't really have to, which will be important for this talk. Um, starting from that, you can do classical Monte Carlo simulation for O3 vectors. And you can look at dynamics by doing a kind of form of MD simulation in which you numerically integrate the Heisenberg equations of motion. Uh, here's an example from our own work, which we turned into a movie of a simulation of a, a really very complicated spin half magnet, uh, this uh, calcium chromate. Uh, and from the MD simulation, you, you can literally fly through the, the very complex dynamics of the system. You see it's doing different things at different time scales, color coded at red is slow, green is fast. If you, if you sorry, green is slow, red is fast. If you look at the slow dynamics, you'll see it's all groups of three spins together. If you look at the fast dynamics, you'll see that's a bit different. It's a very, very powerful technique. And it often gets surprisingly close to what's happening in experiment, even though uh, it's, it's classical or semi-classical in its nature. So um, there's a problem if we want to do this for a spin one. And that is that a spin one is not a two-state system. It's a three-state system. It has a quadrupole moment, uh, an SC equals zero orbital, if you like, uh, as well as a dipole moment, uh, the SC plus and minus one orbitals uh, are, are dipoles. Uh, and so the classical limit of a spin run moment is 
not an O3 vector, it's something else. Uh, and that means that we can't carry over these, these O3 based Monte Carlo and MD simulation systems to spin around magnets. We'll get quite a lot of things wrong if we, if we try to do that. Um, so what can we do? Uh, and this talk will be about a way of, of getting the same kind of simulations out for spin one that I've just shown you for spin half. So to do that, we need to tr treat dipole and quadrupole moments on an equal footing uh, and deal with a three-state basis. And you've seen something like this before. Um, so if you, if you dig in your memory for um, the theory of quarks and quantum chromodynamics, um, these are three-state problems. Um, and, and the algebra that you, you probably remember was SU3. And that's the same thing we're going to need, to, to need for spin one. So I'm going to tell you kind of two things today. Uh, one is about final temperature thermodynamics of spin and magnets from classical Monte Carlo simulation. So, and we'll, our starting point will be a canonical Hamiltonian. I'll explain it in a minute. It's the most general SU2 invariant form that we can write down. Uh, here, written in terms of generators of the group U3, which turns out to be a very convenient way of dealing with spin one. And here is well, somewhat motivated by NIGAS, the, the uh, phase diagram, finite temperature phase diagram of this model on a triangular lattice, uh, uh, which includes phases which are ferromagnetic, ferroquadrupolar, so spin pneumatic, antiferromagnetic, or three sub lattice, 120 degree antiferromagnetic, antiferroquadrupolar, um, and all of the phase transitions that go with it. Uh, and the second part of the story will be about dynamics. And he, again, in terms of these generators of U3, there's a very compact, neat, easy to write down equation motion, which is also compact and neat to code and numerically integrate. Uh, and we can get uh, semi-classical or semi-classical dynamics. I'll come back to the distinction uh, from MD simulation. Here is an MD simulation corrected for classical statistics. It's actually carried out in a ferroquadrupolar phase. So these are the Goldstone modes of ferroquadrupolar order. And here is the prediction of a multiple boson expansion, which is the correct generalization of spin wave theory to a spin one system. And you can see they are visually identical. Um, so um, that'll be the second part. Credit to the people who did all the work. Uh, Kim, uh, all analytic um, calculations and most of the analytic ideas come from Kim. Uh, most, not quite all of the simulations come from Rico. The other simulations come from Yataka. Uh, and Judith kept a stern eye on what we were doing um, and, and uh, corrected a few things when we weren't quite being adequately respectful of the mathematics. Uh, funding from, from OIST, QRC project, uh, and also Kahenhi. Okay, so back to the beginning. Spin one in the wild, as Kim likes to put it. NIGAS is a system of spin one nickel, two plus atoms on a triangular lattice. It's a delaphosite structure. Um, it has, as already mentioned, a T squared heat capacity which suggests linear excitations, because it's approximately two-dimensional. Uh, linear excitations would be perfectly natural if it, if it was antiferromagnetically ordered, and you lead dispersing excitations, but it isn't. Uh, neutron scattering is pretty unambiguous on that. So, um, in fact, there's no conventional magnetic order that anybody's ever really been able to dig out. So it was suggested this could be a spin pneumatic, which would have, as we've just seen, linearly dispersing goldstone modes, which could explain the T squared and the absence of, of magnesium. That, this is a problem that people still work on to this day. Sodium nickel cal uh, sodium calcium nickel fluoride, so this pyrochlor spin liquid, with the caveat being it does freeze at low temperatures in a in a spin glass way. So this is um, a pirate claw. It's a rather beautiful crystal of it. Um, neutron scattering has pinch points, bow tie patterns, familiar to anybody who, who works on spin ice and related problems. I see they're a lot like the pinch points of the Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And this suggests algebraic correlations above, above the spin glass temperature. 
and it has this really rather interesting dynamics. Um, so the, the, here's the experiment. And here are a couple of extent, attempts to explain it using O3 vectors. So linear spin wave theory is semi-classical dynamics of O3 vectors, actually written in terms of bosons, and MD is explicitly semi-classical dynamics of O3 vectors. You can see that they agree perfectly with each other, and you can see that they don't agree with the experiment in that the distribution of spectral weight is wrong. Here, yeah, this is almost gapped. There's at least a pseudo gap, so the weight's above some energy scale. Here, the most intense scattering is occurring at zero energy. So there's something missing from the O3 simulations. Um, nice work though that is. So the ion system that I, I mentioned, this is a triangular lattice of, of actually J equals one moments, but that'll be the same as S equals one for us for now. Uh, here in elastic neutron scattering has been, been done at S and S. Uh, they get a really rather clearly resolved spectrum, which in detail, again, just does not match conventional O3 derived spin wave theories. Does work, you can explain it pretty well with the multiple boson expansion. And what multiple boson expansion can do is deal with the quadrupoles. So it's been two excitations, and you, you can resolve from experiment features going the hybridization of spin one and spin two modes. So there's linear spin wave theory going wrong. And the multiple boson expansion, you can see, as you can see, works quite well. And the numerics that I'm talking about, the simulation approaches, will be equivalent to multiple boson expansion. So there are plenty more magnetic insulators. Here are some more interesting spin one systems picked. Well, not quite at random, but somewhat so. Uh, there are some metals. Um, people quite like talking about systems related to ion-based superconductors in terms of effective spin one magnetism models. Uh, some of those have been modeled using this bilinear biquadratic model, just like, like NIGAS, and you see similar kinds of magnetic order in those. Uh, and they're called atom analogs. Um, uh, so there are various ways of making something like uh, a spin one magnet using, using cold atoms in traps, which have been now reasonably well explored. Uh, so there's, there's basically a bunch of stuff that one would like to be able to do theories for. So we're going to the zoo now, familiar animal, spin half. So we can write it in any state in terms of two complex numbers, which you could also think of as a, uh, as a point on a block sphere. And uh, our algebra is spanned nicely by SU2, so our spin commutation relations, uh, and the classical limit of this is an O3 vector. That's all great. Oh, this is not relevant because I don't think Christian spoke about this in this meeting. Uh, so how do we get dynamical quantities from this? Well, first we do classical Monte Carlo simulation. So generate a thermal distribution of O3 vectors. Then we, new, then we take a set of configurations out of the ensemble that we've generated and numerically integrate their dynamics by hand, by, not by hand, on a big computer, uh, which goes surprisingly fast. And from that, we can get dynamical structure factors and, and we can compare with experiment. So the name MD, um, I think comes from these papers by, by uh, Mersner and Chalker. Um, uh, MD means different things to different communities. Spin one is different. Uh, so I've already noted you can't write this three state system, a general state that's just as a point and block sphere. So we need to do something different. Uh, immediate consequences of the, the three-state nature of the spin one are well, new interactions. So these take the form of biquadratic interactions, which are not allowed for spin half. Uh, and ultimately, we will see that those are basically interactions between quadrupoles and single ion anisotropies, which are also not allowed for, for spin half, can also be written in terms of on-site quadrupoles. Um, so that kind of Hamiltonian and new kinds of excitations. So spin wave, if we started say with a ferromagnet, all the spins pointing up, it would be a spin one excitation where we just move a spin down one unit of angular momentum. But here we can also move an individual spin down two units of angular momentum. So at the level of the single site, we've always, we've got quadrupolar excitation as well. And we need to solve the problem properly to address both. 
So spin wave theory has to be generalized to include more than one boson. This was figured out back in the days of the Soviet Union by Matt Vaev and, and worked on by some others. That's now pretty well known. Um, so how would we represent a spin one? We're going to have three complex numbers this time. We, we pick a basis. And it'll often be useful to use a non-magnetic basis. So a convenient one is, is actually quadrupole moments on the x, y, and z axis, which if you write them in terms of the magnetic basis, it's been plus or minus one and zero, much like that. And now our algebra is, is or everything we can do with this is, is spanned by an SU3 algebra. So here are the Gelman matrices to compare with the Pauli matrices that we were using for SU2. And if you'd like to learn all this math, Carlo has written a really nice textbook chapter about it, and you can read about it there. Or you can see it reviewed in Kim's epic paper. What can you do with this? Well, from this point, you can derive the kind of generalized spin wave theories of, of Matveyev. Uh, you can derive effective field theories. Um, that, that can be quite entertaining. Uh, you can do classical Monte Carlo simulation. Not massively developed, but, but there are a couple of examples in literature. And you write down equation of motions for generators of SU3. To the best of my knowledge, this was, was first done by one of Carlo's master's students and, and more or less at the same time by Kim, um, recently revisited by Jang and Batista uh, in, a, in a slightly more general um, coherent state framework. So, what else is possible? Well, if you're heroic, uh, I guess Andreas was responsible for this. You can do exact diagonalization, but small clusters only. Quantum Monte Carlo, actually you can do in some cases where there are unfrustrated interactions. And there's some, there's some nice results in, in those cases, starting from this work of Harada and Kawashima. And quantum you can do um, quantum Monte Carlo dynamics of memory time and continue to real time and, and learn something about dynamics too. But, but then the restrictions get even greater. Uh, interesting development, tensor wave functions for spin one. So far, to the best of my knowledge, ground states only, no dynamics. Okay, so what would we like to be able to do? Explore dynamics of complicated, frustrated models compared with experiments. So say the pyrochlor, NIGAS, um, we'd like to really be able to analyze those in detail and compare with experiment. And we'd also kind of for fun, be able to do things like simulate the dynamics of complicated objects, vortices, skirmions, stuff like that. See how they change with temperature maybe. So we need a finite temperature method, giving access to large clusters with no restrictions on interactions, because these systems, they have a lot of interactions. Waiting for the sign-free cases is not, is not so happy a strategy. So is there an easier route to semi-classical predictions and stuff we've already talked about? And here, there's a, there's a rather seminal paper by Papa Nicolau, who analyzed that um, bilinear biquadratic model, which I mentioned earlier. So Heisenberg interactions plus s dot s squared. Uh, he analyzed it on a bipartite lattice, which turns out to be quite complicated in some ways. Pointed out that they're actually SU3 points, which are really quite interesting. Uh, so the so you, you could tune the interaction so that the symmetry of the model was SU3, not SU2. And also pointed out that the best way of doing SU3, in some sense, was to write everything in terms of U3. And that's symbolically what's going on here with dipole moments of quadrupole moments of spin, sorry, ah, quadrupole and dipole moments of spin, his notation is different from mine, being written in terms of these three by three matrices, They're actually a, a species of rank two tensor, if you're being precise. Um, uh, so based, loosely speaking, the, the anti-symmetric combinations could be dipoles and the symmetric ones could be quadrupoles. And these close to a nice U3 algebra, which is much, much simpler in terms of structure constants than SU3, much nicer to work with. So um, we can think of this as a mapping from the three spin components and five quadrupole moments, which are defined for a single site, for a spin one moment, to nine generators of U3. SU3 has eight generators. If you like the quadrupoles and the dipoles, we'll give you those. Need to add one more generator, and the generator we're going to add is the total spin length squared, which, if you have um, SU2 symmetry and your Hamiltonian is conserved anyway, 
So this is the mapping that we're going to make. And we're going to impose a constraint that trace A is equal to one. A is this, this rank two tensor or, or three by three matrix. Uh, and that's basically going to fix S squared. So we don't have any need to worry about. And if we do that, it's just the same as working in SU3, but easier. So this is the approach we'll take. And we can now come back to the, the barbecue model, which is the most general SU2 symmetric spin one model we can write down for um, a bond. The physical content to this is an interaction between dipoles on single sites, plus an interaction between quadrupoles on single sites. And we transcribe that in terms of generators of U3, and we end up with an SU3 symmetric contraction and an SU2 symmetric contraction. And this J2 minus J1 basically measures how far you're away from the special SU3 points, the Nicolau point. So this Hamiltonian is, importantly, quadratic in generators of U3 and treats dipoles and quadrilles on equal footing. That means it's a really nice thing to work with the mean field theories from Monte Carlo simulation and as we will see from dynamics. So let's, let's do thermodynamics first, Monte Carlo simulation in terms of generators of U3. So um, here's the phase diagram for this triangular lattice barbecue model, um, studied by quite a few groups, motivated by NIGAS. And here are, uh, we're, we're now writing, um, sorry, if was, I've forgotten if this is on the previous slide. Um, so we're going to parameterize the Hamiltonian J1, J cos theta, J2, J sine theta, so we have an angle theta. Uh, so we can put it, we got a kind of pie chart phase diagram as a function of theta. And here we're looking at dipolar correlations and from our Monte Carlo simulation, that finite temperature, it was done for 2,300 spins, but we can do a lot bigger than that if we really want to. Uh, you see the ferromagnetic and the antiferromagnetic ordering vectors, but you don't see anything in the gaps where the, the quadrupolar phases are. If you look at the quadrupolar um, structure factor, you see those phases, and you see that the quadrupoles also take on a finite value in the dipolar phases, where they're secondary order found. Um, so um, here we enforce trace A is equal to one by construction. So actually we're basically doing simulations in SU3, but using U3 maths. So here's a benchmark for those simulations. We've calculated the, the evolution of the ferroquadrupolar order parameter uh, with temperature and system size for a given parameter set for sizes L equals 12, 24, 48, 96. And you can see empirically it has this form. Uh, we can calculate the coefficients here actually analytically in the low temperature expansion. And look how alpha, the, the, the linear T correction to the zero temperature or mean field order moment varies um, with system size L. And we see fitting our simulation results to um, well an analytic um, analytic numerical plot here, uh, the, the, the low temperature expansion, the analytic theory and the simulations agree perfectly in the limit of low temperature. So there's no adjustable parameters at all. And that log L you'll recognize immediately as the Merman Wagner theorem coming to get us. This is a two dimensional system. We should not see spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry in the thermodynamic limit. But at a finite size system, actually, you see quite a lot of order parameter. Correction is logarithmic. It takes off slowly, but it gets big in the end. OK, no adjustable parameters, perfect agreement. So from that, we can progress to a finite temperature phase diagram, which I showed briefly at the beginning of the talk. It looks like this. Uh, and I've already mentioned this statistical working with SU3. That was the parameter set for the benchmark calculations I've just shown you, and it'll be the parameter set for benchmark calculations of dynamics, not follows. So, dynamics. Uh, so, this nice quadratic form of the Hamiltonian combined with this lovely simple algebra, really tailor-made for giving you a nice equation of motion. So differentiate the A matrix with respect to time, same as taking commutator with the Hamiltonian, and that's going to be quadratic. So this is what it looks like. Uh, and this automatically satisfies 
automatically conserves the trace of the matrix A. So we don't need to worry about enforcing this constraint that trace A is equal to one very much. We get it right at the beginning, it's right forever. Um, so then that means that though we are working in U3, it's equivalent to working in SU3. So here's the simulation. We're going to do Monte Carlo, make a thermal distribution of these A matrices, numerically integrate equations of motion, because the time series, calculate physical observables. These are, will show us structure factors mostly, uh, and these could be structure factors for uh, dipoles, quadrupoles, or the A matrices themselves, which are the most fundamental object because they can describe anything that spin one does, not just its dipole or quadrupolar degrees of freedom. And there's the, the missing bit of maths that gives you the, the dipole, which we'll emphasize. So this anti-symmetric combination. Uh, and then we'll FFT it to, to get a, a result. So a couple of sanity checks, conservation of trace A, tick. It's perfect by construction. Conservation of energy, pretty good. Look how many decimal places this down. This is not a symplectic method, so energy is not perfectly conserved. But you can always do it. You can always work a bit harder on your runger cutter order if you feel you need to 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 get a bit a bit better precision on this. This, this is is working pretty well at RK four already. Okay, raw results now is the ferroquadrupolar phase, uh, and that's what the dispersion looks like. So makes sense. Your linearly dispersing mode. We should do. Um, uh, here's the quadrupole dispersion. Yeah, now we see that the weight is mostly in quadrupoles, as it should be, because um, the Goldstone mode has is a spin two excitation, uh, and there's the A matrix, which structure factor diagonal structure factor really sees both. Now it's interesting to pick a wave vector. This is this is K, everyone's own corner, uh, and look at how this line shape, so a section here, in the dispersion. Uh, and K is actually where the dipolar correlations are pretty bright. Um, although this is the, the A matrix, which is everything. And you see at high temperatures, we have a pretty fat line. Uh, it's actually a Voigt profile, so it's a Lorentzian convoluted with the Gaussian. There's a Gaussian window in our MD, so you know, it makes sense if there's a Lorentzian lifetime underneath. Uh, and you see this thing slowly migrates towards this dashed line was the, which is the prediction of the flavor wave theory, so the multiple boson expansion. So this is what we should get in the limit of zero temperature. Dispersion-wise, we're doing really good. Uh, it's converging exactly on the value it should as t goes to zero. Intensity-wise, we're doing pretty rubbish. So the, um, the intensity is vanishing as we, we head to zero temperature, and there's an obvious reason for that, that we're relying on thermal excitations of the system, and there aren't any at zero temperature no dynamics because nothing was thermally excited. Um, it's not a quantized simulation. So um, we have an issue. Uh, and we need to now to think a bit harder about our quantum classical correspondence and what we meet, whether or not we're allowed to talk about this as a semi-classical simulation. So here's a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, and we can rewrite our Hamiltonian in terms of a multiple boson expansion as basic as basically a sum of simple harmonic oscillators with usual XP commutation relations. And then we can solve this for quantum correlations at t equals zero uh, with well-known commutation relations imposed, or we could ignore the commutation relations and solve for classical correlations at finite t. So let's take both approaches and compare the results. And what we find is that in the limit t goes to zero, we can correct for the effect of classical statistics by multiplying by h bar omega upon kBt. Okay, so this is this is really only defined in a limit, uh, but we, it gives us a, a prediction that we can use an experiment by basically just multiplying by h bar omega on kBt, and then numerically taking the limit t goes to zero by simulating at lower and lower temperatures. If that reminds you of the fluctuation dissipation theorem probably should. Uh, this is described in, again, Kim's epic paper. There's some related discussions in earlier work of ours and, and in one of the papers on the nickel pyroclub. How well does this work? And the answer is um, perfectly. 
Um, so here is the, the U3 MD, corrected for classical statistics. Here are those peaks, fat at high temperature, thin at low temperature, marching now beautifully towards the prediction of the zero temperature quantum theory. Now, this is the linear multiple boson expansion, which is a semi-classical approximation to the dynamics of the spin one magnet. And you can see it's the same semi-classics that we get out when we do this omega bond T, when we use this prefactor omega bond T to correct for classical statistics. So dispersion and intensity now converge on the semi-classical limit, as they should. Uh, and that means we have a usable approach uh, in simulations, at least at low temperatures. Okay, so now let's come back to the dynamics, multiply by uh, omega bond T. I'm not going to worry about the H bars and the KBs at this point, uh, and compare with a multiple boson expansion at a linear level. And you can see now the agreement is perfect. And tellingly, the dipolar correlations are now vanishing as you approach the ordering vector for the very quadrupolar state, which they should. The quadrupolar correlations on the hand are diverging as you approach that order vector. The intensity is diverging, which they should. And the A matrix does what it should. So everything works. Okay, where does this leave us? So the story I've told you about is finite temperature thermodynamics. The first part was finite temperature thermodynamics for classical Monte Carlo simulation, writing things in terms of A matrices, and then generating a thermal ensemble of A matrices governed by the Hamiltonian. Uh, and we, we, we've studied this for the spin one bilinear biquadratic model on a triangular lattice and find the phase diagram that looks like this. Uh, we've also looked at numerics for the same model, also a triangular lattice. Uh, we've we concentrated on the paraquadrupolar phase. We simulated the others, but the paper was long enough without them. Uh, and we find once we correct for classical statistics, which are inherited from the Monte Carlo simulation, we get perfect agreement with the, um, with the MD. Uh, so, uh, here are some things I didn't get to tell you about, and, and won't, I guess, for reasons of time. Uh, so, U3 methods, you can extend to systems with spin anisotropic interactions, and the short version is it all just works. You can read about this in, in the long paper if you wish to. Um, I haven't told you about the details of how you do an analytic theory of thermodynamic properties. That's actually mildly interesting. Again, it's all in the, in the long paper. Uh, and you can also use the same thing to derive the multiple boson expansion. Uh, we knew how to do that anyway by other methods. It's quite nice to, to see that you can get it out of generators of U3 if you want to. Please ask me about these things if you're interested. Uh, and this I, I can't resist showing. So I said, you know, it would be fun to be able to look at dynamics beyond Goldstone mode. So here's some dynamics beyond Goldstone modes. This is a system for parameters which will give a ferroquadrupolar state. It's been quenched through its phase transition into well, actually a, a KT-like phase transition into the ferroquadrupolar state, Merman Wagner again. Uh, and uh, as in the process, we have kind of frozen in some of the vortices associated with that KT transition. Now, these are different from the cosmic stalus vortices, which are U1 windings. These are Z2 windings, which means that vortices are their own anti-vortices. This has been well studied in classical theory of liquid crystals, but not the dynamics. And now, we've, now we can look at dynamics. So you'll see there are two vortices here and here, starting to radiate some quadrupole waves. They get closer and they will spin around each other and annihilate. Now, if this reminds you of two black holes spinning around each other, annihilating and emitting a ton of gravitational waves, it should, because the um, Goldstone modes of the ferroquadrupolar order, which is what's going on the rest of it, are massless spin two bosons. But they are, in, in a mathematical sense, basically the same thing as gravitational waves, quantized. I love this, so I'm going to show it again. Two vortices getting close together. There's a small angular momentum which you start to see as they spiral together. And then lots and lots of radiation. So this is fun. Tell me about it another day. Uh, this is also quite fun. And I, again, a subject for another day. 
uh, Rico, in collaboration with Yuki Motome, took the method and applied it to the bilinear, biquadratic models. Um, a child together with the Kataev model. So we put these two things together. Were we thinking about a spin one um, Kataev problem? Actually, we'd have to put these two things together because these kind of interactions are just as allowed as, as these ones. Uh, and this turns out, maybe you don't be surprised to hear, to have a very rich phase diagram uh, with, with many different phases, uh, and including at finite temperatures, uh, a chiral spin liquid, which was, has proved to be quite interesting. Um, story for another day. At this point, I'm going to say thank you for listening and hope that I'm tolerably on time. Thank you, Nick. Questions? Yeah, Carl. Hi, hi, Nick. Uh, oh, hi, Carlo. Hi, hi. hi. Uh, I, I have maybe two questions. One is that, I mean, okay. you, from SU3 to U3, I mean, you could do the same thing from SU2 to U2. Yeah, you could. Uh, oh, and was it already discussed? No, I mean, I, I suggested, uh, yeah, the same thought occurred to me. Um, we, we, but given, we, we, I guess one reason we didn't try very hard was, was we already know how to do SU2. We've been playing a bit with, with uh, SU4 to U4, uh, and that, that hasn't so far turned out as pretty as SU3 to U3. Um, but um, no, I'm not aware that it's been done. Right. The, the, the second question is that essentially you start from the classical limit in some sense. Yeah. Uh, if you, in, in, as you do, I, I mean, if, if you look at the Halden, like uh, Sigma model, that the very phase times. Yeah, yeah. Do you expect mm. anything yeah. here? Or? Good question, right. and I, 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 I am currently pessimistic that we can get at that because we know we know that an underlying picture of this would be um, the easiest way to understand the Haldane gap is in a picture where you have singlets between um, pieces of a spin one, uh, right. and there's nothing like that in the in the product wave um, basis, product state basis that we're using in these simulations. So, so that's that's very compactly written as an MPS, but I don't see it coming out of this. I'd be happy to be wrong. Uh, we haven't explicitly tried. Mm -hmm. I, Thank I you. Think so. so. More questions? Uh, question? Oh, sure, Philip. What? Yeah. Hi, Nick. This is Philip Mandels talking. Hi, Philip. Uh, very appealing talk. And um, um, I was wondering, because you have this omega over t correction, yeah. uh, you'd be able to calculate some 1 over t1 for NMR. Because, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. Like a zero, right? yeah, you kind of end up using fluctuation dissipation theorem twice there. But um, I think yes is the answer. We haven't actually tried it, but yes. But what we, I mean, what we need to do basically is take our S upon Q, put an appropriate form factor, S Q omega, yeah. and an appropriate form factor and integrate upon Q. So yes, of course, you could use this to, to calculate um, yeah. NMR with the usual caveats that you need to have a good understanding of of the what the coupling is between the spin lattice and the nuclear lattice and be able to write down the right form factor for that. Okay. But if you can do that, then you can get some predictions for yeah. T1s out of this. And I have another question, if I may. Um, okay, we worked a lot, and especially with Ramesh Nat here, uh, about chromates, uh, which are okay. uh, Heisenberg triangular antiferromagnets, but uh, not with spin one, but with spin three halves. Usually I, three upon two, yeah. Yeah, and I got interested by, uh, by uh, what you didn't talk about, you know, these uh, modes that you, you were having in the spin one, uh, in, a, right. in, in the spin one, and I was wondering whether, you know, it's kind of new and uh, spin three halves that might happen. Because yeah, we, that... have, we have some relaxation that we, well, next time. Oh, next, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I was wondering whether it would be... Uh, so... 
so there will be more modes for spin through upon two. There'll be as well as there'll be spin one excitations, spin two excitations, and spin three excitation. Uh, and how each of these you know, contributes to NMR, I don't want to try and guess in advance. Um, but they're all present. Uh, to simulate that, you know, U3 is no longer enough. Um, you, you need to go to SU4, which you can embed within U4. That's possible. Or you can simulate directly in SU4 by by the kind of methods that we've used here, but but living with with the the ugly complexity of the commutation um, relations of SU4. If you're willing to hardwire those in your code, then off you go. So so it's doable. Uh, but the the maths that I've shown today is really kind of specialized to spin one. Are there any more quick questions uh, from the online audience? Okay, if not, let's thank Nick once more for the nice talk. Thank you, Nick. Okay, thank you.